Um, good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome here today. It's, uh, I think today is a big day. We've, we've been <laughs> planning it for a long time. There's at least three other, two other things that are happening today, as you know. But our one is Maddie, and we've been planning this for a while, Maddie, and yes. we're very pleased to see you here. Before I introduce Maddie, um, I'd just like to remind you to turn off your mobile phones and to say that the presentation, as you know, is on the record and the questions and answers Chatham House rules apply. So you can say anything you like, uh, Maddie. <laughs> it won't be recorded. So um, Maddie Delvo is, is from Luxembourg. She's an MEP since 2014, but has held ministerial positions in Luxembourg, where she's from, the Minister of Education, and also um, Minister of Social Security, Transport and Communications. She was Rapporteur for the report on civil law rules on robotics and Chair of the Working Group on Robotics and Artificial uh, Intelligence, and produced the report that we're going to talk about today and the implications of it on rights, robots and data in the age of artificial intelligence. This report has been very well received. It was actually published in January 2017. So the, the implications in, in the report, we have been looking forward to seeing what's happening both in the Parliament, European Parliament and in, and in the Commission, and it's been passed by the Parliament. Um, amongst the recommendations, as you probably know, of this influential report, there's a number of issues for Europe, and I know Maddie is going to address this, are the creation of a European agency for robotics and AI, a new legal framework to accommodate the wider integration into society, and a consideration of a universal basic income. So, Maddie, we're delighted to welcome you here today to discuss these issues, but also to look at the opportunities, the threats that are brought on by a rapid advance of AI and robotics, and really to ask the question, what is the prospect for Europe, and how can we become, in Europe, a global leader in this area? So, Maddie, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> so, uh, good, good afternoon, and um, I am very pleased to be here. Uh, I like Dublin, although it was quite difficult for me to, to manage to come, because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was supposed to come in, in uh, February, and then we, right. uh, uh, Dublin was blocked. Snow. <laughs> And uh, yesterday uh, there was a storm over Brussels, so <laughs> my plane had three hours delay. Oh, <laughs> but I, nevertheless, I'm, I'm very, and I want to thank you for, for the inv invitation. So first, I, I would like to say that I am re I'm not a scientist. So I am an, what, what I would call an, an informed uh, citizen who is interested in the topic. And um, uh, I, we started to work on robotics um, in 2015. Mm. Uh, it took us two years to come to a report, which is a lot of time. But you know that the European Parliament has not the right of initiative. So we cannot propose a mm. uh, um, regulation or a directive, but we can make recommendations to the Commission and ask the Commission to come forward with uh, initiatives and with proposals. And that is why it was an, what a so-called initiative report, which mm. makes our part relatively easy because we can launch ideas and we don't have to implement them. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was a very interesting uh, work. And um, I would say, if I had to do it today, maybe uh, the report would be more granular, not so general. Mm -hmm. No, because at this period, artificial intelligence was not yet, it started to be a big issue, but not, it was not yet in the hype. So that's why the title is of robotics, but of course we touched on artificial intelligence. <clears throat> um, so first I, want, I would like to say that we try to have a balanced report. Uh, so to show that artificial intelligence and robots can, are useful to humans, that they can serve humanity, society, 
and we want to and we want to be positive to innovation and to for, also to encourage uh, European industry. But on the other hand, we must not close the eyes as there are challenges we have to look at and to discuss because personally I believe that artificial intelligence and robotics will be successful if there is trust of the citizens and the consumers. And so we, we have to try together to find the right solutions in order to realize the, the potential of artificial intelligence. And I want immediate, immediately to say that we did not, I am not a fan of science fiction. I know science fiction is very popular. And this idea that there will be superhumans killing, uh, killing the humans, for me, this is not what is really happening. And I'm afraid that I, I am very frequently in conferences where you have these discussions on, uh, on the, uh, the next generation where humans will be combined with robots and artificial intelligence and they will be superhumans. But I think this discussion tries to hide the real challenges that we have to face now. And uh, this is what, what I think we have to, to concentrate on the existing challenges. So I, I want to take, uh, to tell five challenges. And the first one is about safety and security. <clears throat> because uh, if there is not a maximum level of safety and security, people will not trust. There is a big fear of uh, cyber, um, cyber hacking, cyber security, and I, we know that 100% of security and safety does not exist, that does not exist. But I believe that um, this aspect could be enhanced. Mm -hmm. I uh, once <clears throat> listened to one of an expert who said that certainly we, industry and politics, were not attentive, not sufficiently attentive to this aspect of security when building the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that now we have to pay for this. And I am very glad that the commission decided that cybersecurity would be one of the priority in research. Because for the moment there is, nobody knows how really to organize uh, the cyber, uh, the cyber security. <clears throat> Uh, so we, we call, of course, for safety per design, for security, and for very high standards, which have to, define, to be defined at international level. But we need these standards also to, this is, of course, not hard law, but if there are high standards, we can impose these standards for every entry to the European market. Because for the moment, safety is... Uh, controlled. So you, you, you can be certain that a product with a label uh, safety will not explode, or normally not. <laughs> but uh, there is not such a label for security. And um, so this is the example of the TV that uh, listens uh, to you, uh, which should not happen if we had a control of, uh, of, of security. So, and uh, one, one important uh, element where we insist on is on uh, testing, mm -hmm. because we, these things have to be tested for a long, uh, very long period uh, to be safe. <clears throat> and it is important to define the standards early, uh, because the industry has to adapt. They have to know what standards have to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about Internet of Things, of course, it's the weakest element in the chain that uh, will be hacked. Uh, maybe your toaster or your coffee, coffee yes. machine. Uh, and uh, so if we have no standardization, they will be on the market and we will use them. Mm. Okay, the second, uh, second um, challenge is uh, data protection and privacy. Um, even if we have now the GDPR, we are, which I think is a, a very, it's a masterpiece of the European uh, co-legislator because it's a better protection of privacy uh, and, um, well, we will see how it will be implemented because uh, 20, 28 member states have to implement and uh, regulators have to control. 
which is also a big challenge. But nevertheless, for me, this remains the, the most difficult issue because artificial intelligence and robotics do need data. And they will collect an enormous amount of data and uh, especially robots, I think of care robots or medical robots, they will collect a new kinds of data. If you have a robot in your house, uh, this, this will change uh, your life and this will change the, the quality of the data that will, be, that will be collected. So we have to find answers on how to protect first privacy, but also we know that we need data, so they have to be available. But uh, who has access to this data, which is the biggest challenge for me? Does it belong to private companies who do not give access to others? If data is um, gold of the, or the petrol of the 21st century, then it's of course important to know who can accede uh, to this data. Um, and then there is a big issue of the bias in the data. Uh, of course, I didn't meet a single operator or in industrial who didn't tell me that they do everything to not to have biases in the data, and that there is a control. And but I, well, I, I, I haven't received a satisfactory answer on how they deal with this issue, because, uh, well, we know that. Um, this uh, industry is very male dominated uh, and so there are not many women uh, and we know that the data are very frequently come from white men of a certain age uh, and uh, we, we see this in uh, face recognition but also in voice recognition because voices are easier they, our devices recognize more easily the voice of men than of women and of children. It's very complicated. Elder people is also very complicated to recognize. So there you see that there is a bias uh, in the data. And this has, of course, an influence on if many decisions are made by machines, then, of course, it is, uh, it is a big issue. I, I know that uh, research is going on on this issue, but... Uh, we are not uh, at the end of, of the story. And then, uh, I, uh, something I learned last week, so we normally in Europe, we think that we lost the battle of the data because uh, the data of personal data at big uh, US companies, or the big, I don't speak about the Chinese companies who have an enormous amount of data, uh, but uh, in Europe we have an... Uh, an enormous amount of public data which are not uh, available for, normally not available for companies, but uh, in business to business, <coughs> European, Europeans are leaders in uh, artificial intelligence. So I think we could focus on uh, this part of the business, not business to consumers, but business to business, where you can use also public data. Is, there was also a call of the French uh, government mm -hmm. to open public data uh, to research, but this, if we want a European market, single market, then of course it is necessary that data are compatible and every member state has, or in a member state, every agency has its own design. So this will be, this will need a lot of investment and uh, political will mm. to be successful. <clears throat> well, the third uh, issue is about liability, mm. which is, which was the core of our, of mm. our report, uh, <clears throat> because the question is who is liable for the action of a robot? Uh, the, we, we agreed that it should always be a human, there must be a human in the loop, but it will be complicated to allow responsibility between the designer, mm. the producer, the network operator, because there is a network, the data uh, provider, the owner or the user, so this is a very complicated issue. Uh, we, in the report, we took the view of the consumer. If damage occurs to a third person, there must be, a reparation must be made. And so, uh, 
in the recital, we called on the commission to repeal or to amend the existing product liability directive, uh, which normally should apply in this situation. Uh, so the, the general principle is that the producer is liable for an accident caused by the defect of a product. Uh, so the victim has only to prove the damage uh, and the, co the causal relationship between the product and the damage. And the product is considered uh, defective when it does not provide the safety which a person is entitled to expect. And this there is, will be the difficulty with uh, robotic robots and mainly especially self-learning robots, because mm -hmm. if they take the data from the environment, um, and if there is an upgrading, a regular upgrading, which happens with all our smartphones, we re normally receive a call to upgrade, and if you don't do it, then are you, is the user liable because he was negligent, or was it a default by the uh, producer? So these questions are not clear. And uh, so, and you have a multiplication of uh, intermediaries that make it also difficult to identify uh, the liable uh, the liable producer. Uh, <clears throat> what is the reasonable use and so on? So we we uh, suggested that we should that the commission should make a proposal. And I know that the Commission is working on it. They are working, have been working on it for four years now without coming to a conclusion because there are two schools. <clears throat> the, the people saying that the product liability is perfect, but now we saw that in the last uh, communication of the Commission, the Commission agreed that they would, would give a new interpretation of the product liability directive. So this is a signal that it is not so perfect. perfect. Uh, and that there has to be a change made. Mm -hmm. And mainly uh, because uh, the definition of a product, was this directive dates from the 80s, and of course there was no discussion about algorithms. So the, the question whether an algorithm is a product mm -hmm. or not a product is not clear. And uh, so we are expecting this interpretation in the next months but uh, there will be not a new, a new proposal. But we could also have a different, there, are, there is a school of thoughts uh, proposing a different approach, the risk management approach, where <clears throat> uh, the focus is not on the person who acted negligently, but on the person, or the company, best placed to minimize the risk. Mm. That means that you don't, that you accept that there is a risk, but as soon as you discover the risk, you, you have to repair it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, of course, also an approach. I pref personally, I would prefer this one because with an evolving technology, it's very difficult to define the level of uh, st the standard that is expected because normally, you, if I take the example of cars, you use your car for five, ten years. And so if the standard was correct when you bought it, maybe five years later it is no longer, it doesn't fit any, anymore. So this, this is, of course, a, a big issue. <clears throat> and then we proposed an um, insurance scheme, at least for some robots, and this, this, of course, implicates that we have a classification of robots because you cannot, uh, you, you need to define different classes of uh, devices. And uh, for this, first, we need in, uh, the insurance industry. And when we started to work, they were not very interested in the topic. Uh, and of course, I understand because they have, um, there is no statistical data available, and insurance works with uh, data. So they don't know at what level to insure, and we have, for the moment at least, no classification of robots. It's, there are different uh, definitions, but there is no classification of a robot, so this is a big work that, uh, that has to be done. 
<clears throat> and uh, well, we, we were very much inspired by the existing insurance system for cars because there you have an, an uh, compulsory insurance and uh, with a compensation fund uh, behind. So I think this could be a model for some uh, type uh, of uh, robots. Uh, and then <laughs> we, we uh, well, we were very inspired in our discussions because the working group worked for one year and a half. Mm -hmm. So we listened to a lot of experts. And um, well, the next generation of uh, robots will be self-learning. And so the link between the producer and the robot is less evident. And then it will be even more difficult to establish liability. And that's where, where the idea came that maybe we could think about a new pers uh, personality, the e-personality. And this raised, of course, an enormous uh, discussion, very passionate, not only in the parliament, but in the large public, because uh, there were some very, very right-wing people uh, who pretended that we wanted to give human rights, that we would wanted to consider robots like humans with uh, rights and uh, duties. And this was a very, a very heavy campaign. But nevertheless, the idea that at least we should discuss this issue uh, remained in the report. It was adopted by a majority of members of parliament, but the commission did not reply to this uh, suggestion. So I think the debate will go on, but not on the level of the institutional, uh, not an, on an institutional level. And of course, I understood also that uh, this could be an element to take responsibility away from the producer. Because if, if he is no longer liable for something, then he, he take, is less careful, I imagine, to put something on the market. This is a strong argument against the e-personality. Okay, then I come to our fourth uh, challenge, which, was, uh, which is ethical principles. So we have, of course, values and principles that are enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the UN Convention for Disabled People. I think we must not neglect this because I believe that robots will be very helpful uh, for disabled people. Um, if you look at prothes prothesis, and uh, so they are fantastic uh, uh, achievements, but uh, well, this will have an, an, an uh, consequence on what we consider as healthy and not healthy. Mm. Uh, this will raise a lot of uh, <coughs> philosophical debates on uh, eternity, uh, how young do you have to, how performant do you have to be, and are you responsible for getting sick if you have a lot of means not to get sick? So this will be a very complicated issue. Uh, but uh, non-discrimination, dignity, autonomy, freedom, and these principles must be respected by robots who interact with humans. Mm -hmm. um, we, so we, we propose that we should have a code of conduct uh, for designers, people, engineers, uh, but uh, also for industry and for the users. How do I use a um, robot? and uh, the creation of uh, ethical committees in institutions. Um, because even if you define principles, you have to, uh, to go down to a practical situation. Uh, I, I don't speak about the car, whether I should uh, kill uh, the pregnant woman or the old, uh, the old man, but uh, if you are in an... Um, in a uh, home for elderly people, and uh, so the robot is supposed to serve the person, but if the person has dementia, who then decides uh, what to do? Uh, and uh, if he, refuse, or he or she refuses to take med medicine, must the robot uh, force it? So all these questions have to be, to be dealt with, and they are very, very practical. And so I am very glad that now these ethical dis discussions are really in the public. And now, um, so the, you know that the in the communications, the commission proposed that we should, that 
still this year, they will come forward with the experts should elaborate a code of an uh, ethical code. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, but there are so many bodies working on ethical principles now that we have to be careful that we will not have an, a zoo of, uh, of different uh, codes. So there we need some harmonization or uh, collaboration between the different bodies. And my last uh, challenge would be uh, the societal challenges and mainly jobs and education. So we know that, uh, well, I have one conviction that uh, Artificial intelligence will change all aspects of our life and it will have implication on all the professions, all of them. And uh, so some, of course, some jobs will disappear, which is, I think, normal with technological uh, development. In the past, there were professions that no longer exist today and uh, new professions arise. As a, so there will be losers and winners uh, and uh, I am not very worried about the winners, but I think nevertheless that we should take care of the losers. Because it's, a, it's one thing is to say that uh, maybe there will be in the whole no loss of jobs, but if I am a person who loses my job and I have no perspective to find a new one, then uh, this is uh, nevertheless an, a, a big worry. And for me, as policymaker, I think the challenge is how can we, how can we organize a society uh, in harmony? Because social peace is, I believe, our biggest, uh, our biggest good. So um, the answer is education, uh, of course. But I, I, I was in my former life uh, Minister of Education in Luxembourg for nearly 10 years. And I know also from discussions with my colleagues that education systems are very slow to change. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, this is really the big challenge. And I, I believe that we should, in the meantime, I have the conviction that uh, we should pay more attention to lifelong learning mm -hmm. and uh, organize in a better way uh, and give incentives to people to profit of the opportunities of long life learning. And because statistics there also show that the better your higher education, the more you use lifelong learning uh, opportunities. And it should be the reverse, that people who had not a good start in education should have more opportunities to, to upgrade their skills. So this is, of course, I don't know how to do it, but uh, I believe there should be incentives. And that's why we came to the proposal that we should maybe give an, an income to people who have no job, but give them the opportunity also to, be, to have their mind free to use these opportunities of lifelong learning. But this, I have to say, it was in the draft report. It was not adopted by the parliament. No, the parliament refused, refused uh, this idea. Uh, so we, there are also uh, discussions on social protection because our proposal was that we should be prepared for different scenarios. If everything goes well, then of course we don't need to change many things. But if there is a shortage of jobs, then of course our financial systems, our social security systems will uh, be in difficulties. And so we should prepare for different uh, issues and certainly have an improved monitoring of what is exactly happened on the job market. Mm -hmm. But I know that studies are now ongoing and of course it's too short to know exactly what will happen. And by definition, the future is unforeseen. So, but at least at, uh, between MEPs, we could agree that we need more expertise. And that's why um, we asked for the creation of a European agency uh, where the expertise could be brought together uh, with uh, scientists, computer scientists, but also lawyers and uh, experts on ethical questions. Be because I think the debate on what is the right principles to be enshrined in robots should not be left to engineers, mm -hmm. but that it should be a broad discussion. So the, um, 
the Commission told us that they don't want to uh, create a European aid agency because there are too many agencies already. And uh, while well, we also can live with uh, this uh, competence given to an existing agency, and I don't give up hope uh, that we will have it one day. Uh, and then the other thing is that we need more debates and better information of the public, because when I go to a, a broader audience, uh, people speak about Terminator, but not about their toaster. <laughs> And, uh, I, and I have to confess, when I started to work on robots, I had also this, uh, this imagination. And when I saw what a robot is for the moment able to do, that's not so fantastic. Mm. So, so uh, I, I think we, we must tell people what is possible and what is not possible in this dom domain, and what they can expect and what they, they must not fear. And so uh, we need an, an, informed, an informed debate and an inclusive debate, not only between experts. So <clears throat> I, uh, and this is why I am very happy when uh, debates are organized around mm -hmm. Europe. And I have to say that now we are for 2018, there are many debates. Uh, taking place, and I, I see a big participation also of experts and policymakers in, in this. Uh, so you know that uh, in April the Commission uh, had a communication finally where they pr propose a strategy uh, for the Union on artificial intelligence. I think this is a, a step in the good direction. First, they promise more money, and I hope that it is not only a promise, but that it will really happen because we need investment when you compare what uh, the amount of money that are invested in China, in the US, in Japan, and in Korea in, uh, in the research and also in the industry of artificial intelligence, you, we, we have not enough money. So this will be the debate on the future budget of the European Union, but also on the involvement of private sector because uh, the big research is made by private uh, enterprises in, for the moment. Uh, when, when I see the money uh, Google, Apple uh, invest in their research, this is, and when I look what is happening in public labs, so th this is quite uh, uh, frightening. Mm -hmm. Fright. <clears throat> uh, and that's why I think uh, we need these codes, ethical charters to be adopted as soon as possible to, to, to have a level, to make clear what, what we don't want and what we want. And then we, has, we have this um, uh, EU Alliance on Artificial Intelligence, and I would invite everyone, uh, when the, once the platform is launched, to participate in, in these discussions. Um, and uh, well, we are waiting for the interpretation of the Product Liability Directive. But I think the most important would be the involvement of member states. That finally, member states do not have a national strategy for artificial intelligence, but that 28, or at least 27, will have a common strategy for artificial intelligence because I, uh, I, I believe that we can win uh, the battle of artificial intelligence if we stick together and if not everyone. Uh, and this will be, if it is done the right way, this will be beneficial for humans. And then we have to pay attention how we will organize the distribution of wealth because mm -hmm. the accessibility, who will have access to these new devices and how, how will we finance this? This will be the big issue after. But first, we, we, I, I think the first thing to do is to remain united and or to keep together and to show that Europe remains competitive in this issue, and, but the societal debate should not be neglected. So I, want, I was too long, and I thank you for your attention, and I, I would be delighted to have your, your questions, remarks, critics, everything. Thank you. Thank you.